Welcome to this discussion where we're going to start thinking about the LM relationship. This is uh, the second half of the ISLM model. In previous discussions, we focused on the IS part. Now we're going to take a very similar approach, thinking about the geometry and the algebra of the LM relationship before we can put the two together as the uh, complete model. We're going to reverse the order of how we did things with the IS relationship, focusing first on the geometry uh, to get the LM curve. And the reason for that is that we need to introduce a new diagram. Uh, the IS curve builds up from investment and savings to this IS investment savings combined relationship. Similarly, the LM curve is going to build up from two underlying curves. Um, the uh, LM stands for liquidity money, but we haven't seen that diagram before. We haven't seen the uh, what I like to call, what a lot of people call, the money market diagram. So we'll be focusing on the geometry in this video because we need to introduce that new diagram. And it'll take a little bit of extra work, but it's worth it. So as a little bit of preface, as I said, LM stands for liquidity money. It's about the money market. So we're building up from the money market the same way with IS we built up from loanable funds. And just like with IS, these, this LM relationship is going to give us a curve that plots R against Y. So if we... Uh, sort of plotted out the dots and then connect them to get this LM curve. It's going to be on a graph that has R on the y-axis and Y on the x-axis. And uh, that might bother you a little bit putting income Y on the x-axis, but that's actually the same as we do in aggregate demand. So hopefully you're, you're a little bit used to it by now. So let's get started. Our starting point is going to be this so-called money market. So I've drawn in the money supply here. It's vertical. Um, it's not the money supply per se. Normally when we talk about the money supply, we mean the nominal amount of dollars. This is the real money supply. It's M over P, so we've divided M by P to get the real amount of money. But essentially you can think of it the same way as, as the nominal money supply. It's controlled by the Fed. The Fed has the four tools that can influence it. You'll want to be aware of all four, four of those tools, so it might be good to pause the video and you know test yourself. Can you remember all four? If not, this would be a good time to go back and check your notes to make sure you're, you're comfortable thinking about all four tools. So that's our supply curve. We're also going to need a demand curve, right? One that slopes down. And we, we've talked about this very briefly earlier in the course, and now it's time to bring it back to life. It's going to be, we're going to label it L. Sometimes people label it MD for money demand. That's fine too. You can label it either way. And it'll look like, you know, like you'd expect. Uh, a demand curve to look like. So we draw it in, we, we have L, and then it'll give us this intersection that determines the real interest rate. Um, I guess I'll label that point. We call it point A. Um, and now what we want to do before moving on and thinking about deriving the LM based on this money market diagram is, um, you know, what is the basis for this money demand? Why do people want to hold money? You know, why does this, for starters, why does it slope down? And uh, more importantly, what, what might shift it? So we've listed here L money demand has two arguments, two things that influence it. The first is the real interest rate, and we can see from the diagram that it must be a negative relationship. So let's talk about that. Why does that make sense? Um, and you might say, actually, you know, what is this notion of demand for money? Do people really have, don't you want as much money as possible? What does this even mean, money demand? Wouldn't you want like an infinite amount of money or trillions of dollars or something like that? So we got to remind ourselves, when we talk about money demand, what we really mean is demand for money as opposed to other financial assets. So for simplicity, it could be money as opposed to bonds. Why would someone want to hold a lot of money? So for instance, currency you could put in your mattress or money like in your checking account, as opposed to having it in some kind of brokerage account where you have a bunch of bonds or stocks or whatever. So let's say money demand versus bonds for concreteness. And this is where interest rates become relevant. What is the interest you get paid for holding money? If you have a bunch of money in your mattress, do you get any interest? And the answer is no, no. That money just sits there. It doesn't grow over time. Um, you know, if anything, you might just lose some of it by chance, right? We all lost some change, just fell out of our pocket. Um, but officially, you could think of it as, you know, 0% interest. In contrast with bonds, you would be earning interest. And the higher that interest you could be earning on bonds, the less and less enticed you'll be to hold a lot of money. Um, if interest rates were 20%, you probably want to hold very little money and hold a lot of bonds and get that 20% interest. 
And that's why we say money demand has this negative relationship with the interest rates. A lot of the time, people like to think of this in terms of opportunity cost. If you're holding money, you're not holding bonds, and thus you're not getting the interest. So the interest is your opportunity cost of holding money. So I'll shorten that to op cost. That's what I want you to think of when you think about money demand and interest rates. All right, then we have this other factor, uh, income. Well, income helps get, a, get, get at the heart of, like, why do people hold money at all? Like, you might say, well, money per pays no interest, bonds pay some interest, so why not just hold all bonds? Why have any money in your checking account or any money in your wallet? And a little reflection on that tells us, well, if you didn't have any money, you couldn't buy anything, right? You can't take the bonds to the store and, and buy stuff with bonds. Um, I've never been to a Dunkin' Donuts and handed over, like, two treasury bonds to buy the donuts. Um, and... You know, so the issue becomes the more stuff you want to buy, then the more money you're going to hold. And presumably the more higher your income is, the more stuff you want to buy. So naturally we would think the higher your income goes, the more money, the more purchases you make. And then the more purchases you make, the more money you need. So this would be a positive relationship. Uh, how would we say? Need dollars for, not for, for expenditure. And now in contrast to the interest rate, which we see plotted here on the diagram, the negative relationship between R and L is sort of shown with this negative slope. The relationship, the positive relationship with income would be shown by shifting the curve. As your income went up, your money demand would be higher at any given interest rate, so the whole curve would shift upward. And we're going to think about the consequences of that, because our derivation of the LM curve basically relies on a thought experiment where we say we have some initial equilibrium point A for some level of income we could say y1, and now we want to think about as your income increases to y2, how would this curve shift? What would the new interest rate look like? And that would give us a second point on the LM curve, and we'll repeat from there. It's a very similar thought experiment to the um, deriving the IS curve. So we're going to go about uh, doing this. We'll have three hypothetical levels of income here on the diagram on the right, y1, y2, y3. We've labeled the diagram for Y1. This is pretty much just copying from the previous slide. Um, our money supply is fixed. It's not influenced by income, but our money demand does depend on income. And at income level Y1, we have a certain interest rate A, um, and that gives us this combination of interest rate and income uh, on the right that, that, I've, that I've labeled, so that's point A. And now we'll just do a thought experiment of thinking, okay, income increases to Y2. What would our new money demand be? Well, it would you know look similar, but it would be shifted up, right? We're going to need to make more purchases. So this is our L with income level 2. And it gives us a new equilibrium point B. And then we can plot that over here. So the combination of Y2 and the interest rate at point B looks like this. And then we could repeat and say, okay, well, now income is going to increase again to Y3. So what would the new money demand curve look like? And it would be shifted up again just a little bit extra, so we'll label L money demand with income level three, and we see again the interest is pushed up a little bit higher, so the point on the right hand side would be at the higher income level we have a higher interest rate, so we get a point like C. And now if we connect the dots, we get our LM curve, and we can see it's clearly upward sloping, sort of the opposite of IS. And that's not too surprising. Often when we have these types of diagrams, we'll have one curve, IS, that slopes down, another curve, LM, that slopes up. The only trick here is that you might be tempted to say, oh, LM slopes up, so does that mean it's a supply curve? And the answer is no. LM isn't a supply or a demand curve. The supply and the demand are on the left-hand side in this money market. The, money, the real money supply is the vertical. The real money demand is the, uh, the Ls the, that slope down. These are supply and demand on the left. The LM on the right is just sort of the, the collection of equilibrium points. That's how we phrased it for IS. IS was a collection of equilibrium points in the investment savings, the loanable funds market. LM is a collection of equilibrium points in the money market. All right. So the last thing we'll do with the LM curve, which is the you know sort of main thing we care about whenever we draw curves, is we'll think about what would cause it to shift. And we'll use the same steps we used for analyzing what would cause IS to shift. So our scenario is that the Fed does something to increase the money supply, and we'd have four options here. And we said earlier in the video, you'd want to be thinking hard about making sure you know, testing yourself on that, you know the four tools that the Fed has. The simplest one here that I would use to, to fill in would be the Fed could um, buy bonds. 
right? Open market operations done all the time. Fed could buy some bonds and increase the money supply. So now we'll go through our three-step our, our three-step process. Maybe before we do the three-step process, we're thinking about how LM shifts. So maybe I should draw in my initial LM curve, right? Here's my initial LM relates R and Y, and now we can think about how it's going to shift. So the starting point will be draw the money market. That's our building block we use to build up our LM curve. Um, we have our initial equilibrium. I'll label it point A. Now the event takes place, the Fed buys bonds to increase M. That means M over P increases too, so that shifts the supply to the right. We'll say this is M over P prime. We can see that this leads to a new equilibrium point with a lower interest rate. So step two, did it increase or decrease? It decreased. And that tells us that the LM curve is now going to represent for any given level of income a lower associated interest rate. So the whole curve is basically shifting downward. So we'll draw this shifted downward a bit. It'll still slope up, and uh, we don't have any particular reason to think that the slope or anything would change, nor do we really care, so we'll just draw in a new line that's lower. And that's in general how we do comparative statics, or at least curve shifting with LM. You'll use this three-step process, draw the money market that the LM is based on, figure out which curve shifts, if any, if it's the money supply or the money demand, L, Based on those shifts, you figure out, did R go up or down? And then that tells you, okay, well, my LM will go up or down. Thanks for watching. Our next video, we're going to start looking at putting IS and LM together. Now that we've got the building blocks, we want to put them together and use them to determine R and Y, the two endogenous variables.